They say it's the safest way to travel. We're losing altitude. We're going to go down. But in the movies, airplane flights often result in terrifying crash landings or colossal mid-air explosions. Behind Hollywood's airborne mayhem are the film industry's model makers, pyrotechnicians, and visual effects artists. Coming up, we'll meet the men responsible for aerial effects, ranging from a perilous Rocky Mountain touchdown in Cliffhanger to a hazardous tropical storm landing in Love Affair. And we'll visit the set of the techno thriller, The Net, where filmmakers are staging a harrowing plane crash into the smokestacks of an industrial plant. We'll learn their secrets for creating terror in the sky, a combination of careful planning, attention to detail, and the explosive force of movie magic. Intercepting approach course, ILS runway 8. In the high-tech thriller, The Net, a computer analyst flies into Los Angeles to investigate some sinister doings on the internet. 3-9 Mike Bravo, we've lost radar contact. Save your position and altitude. But his navigational instruments have been sabotaged, placing him on a disastrous collision course with a group of industrial smokestacks. This really kicks the film into gear because it starts the audience off with that there is something wrong or there's something amiss. Safely staging the plane crash is the job of Sony Pictures Image Works visual effects supervisor and director of visual effects photography, Dave Dreswicki, whose credits include Money Train and Speed. What we're doing is we're shooting this Cessna 172 colliding with the smokestacks and uh, catching it in a and a ball of Hollywood glory. Lots of flames. But like most cinematic plane crashes, the action will be filmed without the use of a real plane. Instead, the scene will be shot with a carefully crafted model. Larry Jolly is one of Hollywood's premier model aircraft makers. He has built a miniature of a Harrier jump jet for True Lies, sculpted miniature helicopters for Cliffhanger and constructed a 737 that has lost the top of its fuselage for Miracle Landing. For the net, Larry and his staff have designed and built a one-quarter scale Cessna with precise detail. Their work began five weeks before tonight's shoot. Located in Westminster, California, Larry Jolly Miniature Productions is a family affair with three generations of model builders contributing a variety of skills. Neat thing is it seems like every one of the family members that does help us out has their special aptitudes and so it's very helpful. We do have a crew that works for us. It's not all volunteer people, uh, but it's very important to know what each person's aptitude is and what they can do best for you. So we've been very lucky. We've got a wide range in the family. Larry's father, Jim, helps supervise production of two identical model Cessnas. Since one will be destroyed on the first take, the other will allow for a second take if necessary. Built from scratch in the Jolly's shop, the Cessnas required the creation of 40 different molds. Each mold begins with construction of a plug, an exact replica of the model part sculpted out of wood and polyurethane foam. This is a, a plug or a wing of the Cessna that you can see in the background here. Relying on photographs of actual Cessnas, the Jollies add accurate panel lines and rivets to each plug. The rivets are acrylic, uh, and they're applied with a syringe, just like a normal hypodermic needle, only it's not one you'd like to get stuck with because it's quite large. A mold is formed by covering the plug with several layers of fiberglass and epoxy resin. Requiring two days to dry, the mold is then removed from the plug. Each model part is also formed from fiberglass and epoxy resin. When removed from the mold, it is spray painted and covered with clear urethane to harden the surface. To simulate the real aircraft's plexiglass windshield, 
Clear plastic is heated and stretched over a windshield plug using a vacuum form machine. The plastic is then trimmed to fit the model's cockpit. It'll be glued in here and glued in here and as you see, there's your window. Model aircraft used in movies are designed to allow for quick on-set repairs. The Jollies build their models in several separate modules. This is a motor and mount module simply mounted onto the firewall of the original aircraft. Now, in the field, if something goes wrong, we simply pull the whole front end off and put another one on. Since the script for the net requires the plane to fly directly toward one of the cameras, the cockpit will be visible. This necessitates a miniature pilot. Larry's wife, Carolyn, views videotape of the actor who plays the pilot and then attempts to match as many details as she can. Carolyn is not only a skilled seamstress and painter, but also knows aeronautics. In fact, she is employed as an engineer scientist for McDonnell Douglas. Even their eye color seems to be important. You can see that they have blue eyes on these models. The model is built to be one-fourth the size of a real Cessna 172. This relatively large scale helps make the plane look as realistic as possible, but is still small enough for the crew to handle and operate safely. The completed model weighs 25 pounds and has a nine-foot wingspan. On the movie set, the plane will be suspended 25 feet above the ground by three guide wires. Larry installs hooks for the guide wires on both wings and the tail. Each hook is then tested for strength. It just took 20 pounds. Since each hook can support 20 pounds, together they can hold 60 pounds. More than enough for the 25 pound model. The extra margin gives Larry an added measure of security, compensating for pressure that might result from wind gusts during filming. Okay, is that it? We're out of here. Five weeks of intensive work are about to reach an explosive conclusion. But for Larry Jolly, seeing his efforts go up in smoke is just part of the job. People ask me that all the time. How can you build these beautiful models and have them destroyed? And actually, uh, it's not that kind of an emotional attachment. In the movie industry, I get to design the whole thing, build it, break it, put it away in a matter of four or five weeks and go to the next one because there's always the next one. Larry Jolly's Cessna 172 will soon be armed with explosives on the set of the net. The filmmakers hope to thrill and fool movie audiences as the plane plummets into miniature smokestacks for a fiery finish. Coming up, visual effects artists of the future stage a spectacular crash landing starring a famous B-29 bomber. The year is 1945. A B-29 bomber carries the mechanism of the atomic bomb destined for Hiroshima over the New Mexico desert. I can't see it good. All right, boys, clear the radio. Suddenly, the engines fail. McGuire, what's going on? Crash position. The pilot must make a perilous emergency landing in a desert sandstorm. This action sequence begins the tense drama of Trinity, a short film that utilizes traditional Hollywood techniques for staging exciting plane crashes. But these filmmakers are a long way from Hollywood. They are students at the Graduate Film Conservatory of Florida State University in Sarasota. Under the guidance of its dean, Dr. Raymond Fielding, the conservatory emphasizes visual effects. The crash scene that was finally created, integrating full-scale scenes with miniatures, introduces a film that has gone on to win those university filmmakers several first prizes and awards at film festivals throughout the world, and which is now in commercial release. Trinity also features the only operative B-29 bomber in existence on loan to the film from the Confederate Air Force of Texas. Dubbed Fifi, the aircraft has starred in several films, including The Right Stuff and Fat Man and Little Boy. Written and produced by FSU student Thomas Rausch and directed by classmate Eric Fleming, 
Trinity's aerial action was shot in three basic locations. Fifi's flight deck was reconstructed on one of the conservatory's sound stages for shots involving the crew. You want to drop the crate? No, we can't. We bailing out? Negative. Cockpit shots and in-flight shots were filmed using the real Fifi. Shots of the emergency landing were filmed using a small model of the B-29. Oh, it's excellent. Fog machines, sand, and air hoses created the illusion of a raging storm. Using effects techniques, in some cases that are almost a century old, as well as the most modern digital technology, these FSU apprentices create images that enhance the production value of the stories and the events that they dramatize on film. Bravo, verify your position and check your instruments. Visual effects are also crucial to enhancing the drama of the net. The film's plane crash scene is supposed to take place in an industrial park, but the sequence is actually being filmed at a neighborhood park in Los Angeles' San Fernando Valley. Paul Pearson, president of Proper Effects Incorporated, is building the model smokestacks that the plane will collide with. Based on real smokestacks that stand 100 feet tall, Pearson's models are only 25 feet tall in order to match Larry Jolly's one-fourth scale Cessna. Each is constructed in two sections from wood and soft metal tubing. Quarter scale railings and catwalks add to the realism. Paint is applied with sponges to create the look of a cement texture. Black spray paint around the top of the towers creates a smoke-stained effect. The intricate detail of both the towers and the model Cessnas will help visual effects supervisor Dave Dreswicki achieve a convincing effect sequence. Well, certainly the most important thing is that when it's in the movie, no one would ever recognize that it was a miniature shot. Larry Jolly and his team have arrived on set and are prepping the model Cessna. Well, I can do that now. The script calls for the plane to have its right wing sheared off by one of the towers before crashing into a second tower. Jolly's crew scores, or cuts the wing, and then reattaches it to ensure it breaks off as planned. Pyrotechnician Richard Helmer lines the interior of the wing with Primacord, a powerful explosive that will rip the wing apart. During filming, Helmer will trigger the Primacord with a radio control unit. Aluminum foil is placed inside the wing to produce the effect of twisted metal erupting from the explosion. Well, we, just get, we got a couple of uh, charges here. One here, one here. Explosive charges attached to the motor mount, inside the nose cone, and behind the cockpit will cause the plane to be enveloped in a dramatic fireball upon impact with the tower. With monofilament line attached to its tail and wing hooks, the Cessna is readied for flight. 23 feet off the ground, the model is suspended from an overhead trolley sled, which travels on 90-foot-long cables extended between two cranes. Though the Cessna's propeller will be turning, the model will actually be people-powered, pulled along the cable by ground crew members. With the help of gravity, the plane will travel at approximately 12 miles per hour. Manpower really seems to be the best thing for this kind of work because it's infinitely controllable. A couple guys can instantly halt what they're doing in case something happens, in case the principal camera jams. Richard Quattrochi of Larry Jolly Miniature Productions and Helmer will operate the two radio control units. This is gonna bank the plane left and right with movements of the right hand, so we're banking the plane right and banking the plane left. And then uh, the second unit is gonna be the pyro controller. He's gonna blow a charge that's going to uh, separate the right wing. And the plane's gonna roll into the second tower, we hope. And at that point, he's gonna blow the main charge. After weeks of careful planning, filming is finally ready to begin. I hope all the cameramen are at their positions, please, for a final lineup. Okay, here we go, action! At a glance, the shot appeared successful. Cut. But a videotape playback tells Dave and his crew a different story. The major reason was simply that the plane didn't 
contact we were supposed to hit. Uh, we thought that the right wing strike on the first tower would have a, a greater effect in, in deflecting its trajectory than it actually did. And then the explosion happened a little bit late, uh, so it was no good. Let's see that what did we learn? Let me show you something. Mm -hmm. With one more model plane remaining, Dave and his crew will make adjustments and reattempt the complex effect. They have just one more chance to make the net's pivotal scene a success. Hey guys, it's a wrap for tonight. Coming up, we'll witness the mountain plane crash in Cliffhanger and return to the set of the net for a breathtaking finale. In Cliffhanger, a Lockheed Jetstar crash lands on a snow-capped mountain. In Love Affair, a commercial jetliner makes an emergency landing during a tropical storm. Both of these exciting moments are the work of Hollywood aerial effects wizards Tad Shinoski and Robert Wilcox. Just off the runway at Van Nuys Airport in Los Angeles, Bob and Tad create model planes that thrill movie audiences. Tad definitely has the mechanical skills and, and the eye for uh, shapes and such for doing the models. He's, he's really the, the artist in the shop. Um, I'm more the, the technical guru that you know, will figure out uh, uh, whether this could, will work or not. Bob and Tad met while working together on Raise the Titanic in 1979 and discovered their mutual passion for radio-controlled model airplanes. Teamed up again in 1991 for Iron Eagle 3, they soon formed a partnership and an effects house, WKR Productions. In the romantic drama Love Affair, the WKR team built a one-tenth scale 747 for an emergency landing during a tropical storm. We brought in a couple hundred tons of sand and said and dressed it. Uh, we built a runway with a track system for pulling the uh, 747. The 20 foot long model was pulled through six inches of water and blowing sand by a cable attached to a truck at the end of the runway, resulting in a completely believable effect sequence. Bob and Tad are also responsible for the memorable Rocky Mountain plane crash in the action-adventure film, Cliffhanger. Shot in Valencia, California, the snow, trees, and rocks were artificial, and the jet was a quarter-scale model. They built a track in the ground to pull the plane. The track was about 250 feet long. Uh, pulled the plane on the track and um, going through various stages of crashing, hitting the trees and the rocks, and that worked, worked really pretty well. It was a great, great shot. Tad and Bob also built a one-tenth scale DC-9 for Cliffhanger's spectacular mid-air explosion. The fuselage was hung from a forklift, lined with Primacord, and filled action. with gasoline. Here we go, action! A detonator triggered a powerful blast. On screen, the DC-9 explodes in a huge fireball for a stunning effect sequence. Amidst the pressures of creating some of Hollywood's great plane disasters, Bob and Tad still find time for the relaxing hobby they share in common. Almost every evening, we uh, go to the model airplane field about a mile away from our shop and uh, no, spend the last hour of the day flying our airplanes together after all this time. Well, this is great. Back on the set of The Net, visual effects supervisor Dave Dreswicki is preparing for a second night of filming the Cessna crash sequence. Strong wind gusts have delayed this second attempt, adding to the tension. A plywood model stands in for the Cessna during lighting and camera positioning. The scene will be filmed with six cameras. Certainly the more angles you have, the more ways uh, you can cut the sequence. So that's what we wanted to offer the, the uh, producers and the editor of the net. Two cameras are actually concealed inside the towers. One will pan to follow the plane's flight so the open backside of this tower is angled out of view of the other cameras. A second unmanned camera is located in the tower that the plane will crash into. It films through a small hole at the anticipated point of impact. The cameras will be overcranked, meaning they will shoot at higher speeds than the normal 24 frames per second. 
We're doing it in order to slow the action down to appear that it's full size. So for instance, uh, if we were to actually crash a plane, uh, the, the chunks of debris that would fly off it and the, and the, and the flames that would come up from it would, uh, would actually be slower because there's more mass to it. Finally, the wind dies down and the model Cessna is attached to the overhead sled trolley. Quiet on the set, please. The take is a complete success. The plane's right wing clips the first tower and shears off in a storm of sparks. It is then deflected nose first into the second tower where it is engulfed in flames. Dave Dreswicki has met his challenge. The magic sort of happens in, in the screening room when you see it with the proper exposure and the proper camera speeds to give it that feeling of this mass and the scale is. Thanks to the careful planning and imagination of Dave Dreswicki, along with the lifelike models constructed by Larry Jolly and Paul Pearson, the net takes off with speed and excitement. And whether it is tomorrow's visual effects artists, for today's aerial effects masters like Tad Shinoski and Robert Wilcox, filmmakers will continue to frighten, thrill, and amaze audiences with the high-flying effects of movie magic.